Hello and welcome to Amazing Mind, the hypnosis TV talk show that introduces you to all sorts of interesting people and topics related to subconscious behavior. My name is Lisa Mackenberg, hypnotherapist, HMI instructor, and host. Today we have an amazing guest, and she's going to talk to us about how to co-parent during high-conflict divorce. Now, my very special guest is Tamar Springer. She's an LCSW from UCLA. She taught parenting at the American Jewish University, and she was a mediator at Los Angeles Superior Court. Please help me welcome my guest, Tamar Springer. <laughs> Tamar, thank you so much for being on the show. Sure. First of all, let's define some of our terms. Uh, what is high-conflict divorce? High conflict divorce is when two parents are parenting, usually in separate households, it could be the same for a period of time, and there are frequent conflicts. There are outbursts of anger, there are disagreements over little to small issues, basically, you know, usually over most things, there are disagreements, and the parents often use the children to get back at the other parent. Mm -hmm. It's not clean parenting. You know, I, the highest conflict divorce I've ever seen the two parents can't talk unless it's through uh, the court or even uh, through their lawyers. Mm -hmm. Is that an unusual situation? Those are especially high conflict and, and it is less usual. Once in a while it is better for those two parents to communicate through a third party like an attorney. How can people possibly co-parent when they're not even speaking? It's very difficult first of all. It's never an easy situation. Uh, the parent needs to learn how to focus on themselves not on the other parent and to educate themselves about children, about children's developmental needs and about parenting issues, and really try to separate out and leave the other parents' business to themselves. You know, one of the things I hear most about is that there's uh, trouble, there's problems during transfers from one parent's house for visitation to the other parent's house for uh, visitation. What kind of tools can people use to make those transitions easier for the parents and the children? Transitions can be difficult and, and they're often a time where people will get into the, you know, the fights or the outbursts and especially in front of the children, that's very unhealthy. So I would say it's helpful to help a parent learn to hold it in and to not take the bait, to not bite if another parent is saying something provocative or that upsets them or anger to to learn how to, to hold back during those transitions. Also, sometimes it's better to have a third party do the transition, either another family member or a friend or a nanny, and often drop off and pick up at a neutral location, like a preschool or a school, uh, even a neighbor's house sometimes. Um, sometimes the police station. Absolutely, that, that, that is often a designated uh, location in court papers. You said something very interesting, that uh, one person really needs to use restraint so many times as hypnotherapists, we're only working with one parent. So even if one parent learns the tools of restraint, not taking the bait, self-regulation, it will make things easier. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I think that parents need to learn how to manage their side of the street. And what that means is learning to let go of obsessive thoughts about the other parent or whatever is happening in the other household and learn to manage their own anxiety and their own feelings. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. That's so easy to say. But when there is high conflict, when there are triggers, and everyone gets extremely agitated, how does someone use self-regulation at that time? People need to learn how to soothe themselves. So self-soothing techniques become very important, and general anxiety management techniques become important that a person can apply at any specific time. Teach us. Okay, um, let's say somebody's having a feeling of overwhelming anxiety come up. They imagine a big red stop sign in front of their face, okay, and that is meant to stop whatever that overwhelming feeling is that's coming up. Another example is, is imagining windshield wipers, wiping away the negative thoughts, okay, so that's how we stop them. The next step would be to come up with a set of replacement thoughts and replace, replacement behaviors or behaviors that one does to distract from something. So the thoughts would be positive thoughts, things that uh, you know make them feel good. It could be a number of different things. And actions would be things that they do to actually physically change their space and get out of the situation that you know is, is bringing up this overwhelming feeling of anxiety. Again, we have so many hypnotherapists in our studio audience and even watching at home. And we deal with one person at a time. 
And certainly, we believe that when you rehearse a behavior, uh, it begins to just naturalize into the real world. Would you say in the four corners of our office we should have people write down those replacement thoughts and behaviors? Absolutely. That is a very good use of therapeutic time to help somebody construct a plan and basically fill their toolbox with tools to manage these very difficult situations and really manage their own emotions. What are the, some of the other triggers of anxiety in a co-parenting situation, either low conflict or high conflict? Well, um, there's so many. There's so many. Um, parents talking badly about another parent is absolutely a trigger of anxiety. Um, new partners in a situation can trigger anxiety or third parties that the parents don't know. I'm going to go back to new partners. Talk to me about new partners after divorce. Okay. Um, parents often make the mistake of bringing in a new person too soon. Why is that a mistake? In the beginning parts of relationships, people's brains are in a state of elevated dopamine. That has been proven by, especially by a research named Helen Fisher, there are others, but she did hallmark research on this topic. Mm -hmm. And elevated dopamine is, is a situation that mirrors addiction. So people are not really in their normal state, uh, biochemically speaking. They're excited, they're excitable, and they're not necessarily making their best decisions or uh, you know, decisions in a calm way. So that relationship may or may not last. It, it's, uh, it's a time of, you know, high, a lot of feelings, a lot of excitement. So give us a rule. When is the earliest you would introduce a new partner to your children? My recommendation is six months. Because six months? I would say six months, because by that time, the, the brain chemicals have settled down to a more natural state, the dopamine is down, and people can think better. And it's, it's important to only introduce somebody into a child's life if that person is going to be around for a while. The revolving door syndrome is you know, bringing a lot of new partners in and out and in and out, and that's not healthy for a child. They're already having enough new experiences and their foundation has already been rocked enough. Absolutely. What are some of the other mistakes that co-parents make? Um, Talking to kids about adult issues, uh, talking to them about their problems, what's going on in their relationships and the divorce, about the other parent. Um, kids are not emotionally prepared to do that. It's also a boundary violation. Children should be allowed to be children and stay out of adult issues. Um, being inflexible, not changing a time if a parent has a special request. For example, if uh, one, one parent has family visiting from out of the country and it lands on the other parent's time, to not allow some flexibility in the schedule so the child could you know, go to the other parent's house with the visiting relatives, mm -hmm. that's an example of inflexibility that only hurts the child. Any others? Uh, being vindictive, I think this is a hot button one and a common one where parents will do things to hurt the other parent uh, because they're hurt about the relationship, you know, or still working through the relationship issues, and it only ends up hurting the child. So using children as a weapon. That's right. Yes. That's right. It only hurts the children. When you hear adult children talk about what that was like for them at when they become adults, uh, it's, you know, it's a reminder and it's, it's painful to hear how much that hurts them. That's a beautiful point, and as uh, therapists and hypnotherapists, we hear from a lot of uh, children of divorce, adult children of divorce, and we hear how painful and how real those experiences are still. And it becomes our job to turn those memories from pain into wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, you said something very interesting before. You said about bringing children into the adult topics. So many divorced parents can make a mistake of uh, treating their children like friends or companions instead of children. And then when the children miss steps and the parent wants to discipline the child, the child says, well, no, 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 that's not a relationship. We're buddies, we're friends, we're confidants, and I do not accept your authority. Can you speak to that? Well, I think it's very confusing for a child. It's, it's really a mixed message to have the parent sort of go back and forth from relying on them for emotional support to being a parent, setting boundaries that parents need to set to, to raise healthy children. So uh, it's, it's really never a great idea to, you know, bring the child into your world as, as your friend. There's other appropriate resources for that, like actual adult friends 
professionals, therapists, support groups. There's certainly plenty of resources for people who are going through this kind of a transition and need support, but the child needs to remain a child. Absolutely. You know, your parenting program is one of the most interesting ones that I've read. It's called A New Paradigm for Parenting, and this um, is actually approved by the Los Angeles Superior Court. What are some of the things that we are going to learn if we read your manual, A New Paradigm for Parenting? One of the things parents learn is how to go from a personal relationship model to a business model so that their business relationship really uh, consists of their mutual business investment, which is their children. So we learn about that model. What else? Uh, we address uh, things like learning, we, we help the parents learn to address issues and actions rather than criticize the other parent or blame the other parent. So there's a big difference between ta speaking about actions and criticisms. Got it. So if you had one thing that you wanted every parent to know, what would it be, Tamar? That the way the parent behaves is teaching the child how to behave. So are you saying that parents, uh, that kids will model up to the parents so that uh, children don't do what you say, but they do what you do? Absolutely. I think a truer thing has never been said. Well, Tamar, so many people are going to want to know, know more about your unique style of parenting and certainly uh, study a new paradigm for parenting. How can they get hold of you? My email, tamarspringer at gmail.com. I want to thank you so much for being on the show, but it looks like we're out of time. I'd like everybody to stay tuned because as we have as our second guest, comedian Susanna Brisk, and she's going to talk to us about her brand new book. So please stay tuned. We have a lot more coming up for you on Amazing Mind. My name is Lisa Mackenberg, hypnotherapist, HMI instructor, and host. Today we have an amazing guest, and she's going to talk to us about how to co-parent during high-conflict divorce. Now, my very special guest is Tamar Springer. She's an LCSW from UCLA. She taught parenting at the American Jewish University, and she was a mediator at Los Angeles Superior Court. Over little to small issues, basically, you know, usually over most things, there are disagreements and the parents often use the children to get back at the other parent. Mm -hmm. It's not clean parenting. You know, I, the highest conflict divorce I've ever seen, the two parents can't talk unless it's through uh, the court or even uh, through their lawyers. Mm -hmm. Is that an unusual situation? Those are especially high conflict and, and it is less usual. Once in a while, it is better for those two parents to communicate through a third party, like an attorney. How can people possibly co-parent when they're not even speaking? It's very difficult, first of all. It's never an easy situation. Uh, the parent needs to learn how to focus on themselves, not on the other parent, and to educate themselves about children, about children's developmental. Please help me welcome my guest, Tamar Springer. <laughs> Tamar, thank you so much for being on the show. Sure. First of all, let's define some of our terms. Uh, what is high conflict divorce? High conflict divorce is when two parents are parenting, usually in separate households. It could be the same for a period of time. And there are frequent conflicts. There are outbursts of anger, there are disagreements. Hello and welcome to Amazing Mind, the hypnosis TV talk show that introduces you to all sorts of interesting people and topics related to subconscious behavior.